Um, so thank you for, for having me here. And uh, it's always strange for me to talk in front of actual scientists since I'm not a scientist. I studied philosophy. Uh, and in particular, I studied the theory of knowledge. Um, and so I'm going to actually talk for a little while uh, about the reasons why I think it's time for a change in the way we approach consent and sharing. Because I think we have to have some justification for the argument for change. Um, and so uh, the, the justification we starts with, with three hypotheses. Right? And so the first hypothesis that I have is that cheap data is actually really transformative. And I'm, I'm sick and tired of people saying big data. I live in, Silicon, in sort of the edge of Silicon Valley now, and you can't throw a rock without hitting a big data, internet of things, private cloud startup uh, that won't tell you what they're doing, because it's stealth as well. But you know, we're, we're next to the Whitehead. We're here at the Broad. I lived across the street at CSAIL for, for many years. Um, big data has been around for a long time. To me, what's different is that data is cheap. It's very, very cheap to generate information that used to be very, very expensive to generate. And if you look at other fields that aren't biology, that aren't health, what's happened is that the epistemology of those fields has changed. Right? And epistemology is what I studied, so it's what I'm comfortable talking about. And the best definition I know of for it is that epistemology is the investigation of what makes a justified belief justified. So if we think something, if we have a belief about something, how do we know whether or not there's a justification for that belief? Is it true? And a good example of this would be baseball. So for a long time, scouts would go out and look at people who were baseball players, and they would have a belief. They would say, yeah, this guy is a good hitter. And my justification is I've looked at his swing, and I have a few data points, like how often he gets on base and how many times he bats people in. And that was all we ever needed. And an entire industry was built on the scouting and judging and evaluation of baseball players in a way that utterly failed in the face of cheap data and computation about baseball. So this is now the formula we use to judge whether or not someone is a good hitter. Right? It's one of about 25 formulas that are used on a daily basis to evaluate players. Um, and I can't even show you the more complex formulas because they wouldn't fit on a screen in a, in a legible form. But now we start to calculate your value over replacement players. We, we calculate all of these other statistics to judge whether or not a certain player is a good hitter, to justify that belief. And so it's the availability of the cheap data and the computation that creates that sort of change in the way that we know what we know. And if you look at this, generally speaking, fields that are, that are based on narrative that tested in reality are the most vulnerable. And I would argue that biology and health are sort of the ultimate narrative fields that get tested in reality. Because we write up papers that, that lay out narratives for what we think is happening in a cell, or what we think is happening genomically, or what we think is happening in an organism. But they get tested in reality when we try to intervene. And that's why I think biology is vulnerable from a hypothetical perspective to this sort of data-driven epistemology change. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, but and a lot of times when I go to smaller labs at places that don't have the computational capacity of a place like the Broad, right, this is actually a heresy. It's like going and, and nailing the arguments to the wall that says, actually, you should start using some different methods to evaluate and generate your hypotheses. And you should question some of the metrics you're using to figure out whether or not what you know is justified. You know, a field that has undergone this completely already is weather. Weather, when I was a kid, I'm 40, uh, weather was not very accurate. And now weather is an incredibly accurate field in terms of local predictions. We know fairly confidently that what the temperature is going to be in Boston today um, because we've already made this sort of epistemological change. And there's sort of four characteristics that, that you see over and over again in fields that have undergone this change. You, in many fields, whether it was weather or baseball scouting, right, gut instinct was prized. Right? And now gut doesn't go away. Right? Good instincts never become unimportant in any sort of research field. But the idea that your gut is the single most important factor is one of the things that has to be beaten up on. And um, you shift to using models and metrics. The low transaction costs mean lots of people can enter that didn't used to be able to enter. And you really piss off the elite. And so uh, this happened this year. Right? So let's think about Nate Silver. And 538, how many people here know who Nate Silver is? 
it's awesome. Right? <laughs> so the transaction cost of becoming a pundit changed over the last four years because of the publication of poll data. And because of the lowering cost of generating poll data, you had the suddenly, it was cheap. There was poll data everywhere. People published their cross tabs. So you could actually build Bayesian models in a real-time fashion that were far more accurate than the elite pundits. So it's cheap data. It's not about big data. It's about cheap data to me. Go ahead. So those are both completely true. And I'm going I'm to try to illustrate how all of this can lead to a logical fallacy that increase the cost of health if we do it wrong. I have, I have my own pet example. But yeah, the baseball is easy because the core units are the out and the run. Weather is easy because the core units are you know, precipitation and temperature. And we have relative consensus on how to measure those. Right? Even though if you don't know whether you're using the European scale or the English scale, you can have a serious temperature problem. If you don't know what time you're predicting the temperature for, you can take the wrong clothing. Um, those are simplistic examples. I'm using them to try to sort of set up the argument, but it's, it's a fair point. All right, so um, so here is, here's the second piece, which does tie into this, which is that data is becoming cheap enough to change this change, to create this change in health. It is not already cheap enough, and cheap isn't going to be enough on the line, right? So this is the slide that you're required to show when you talk about decreasing costs. Um, I, I find this slide interesting. I find the decrease in the cost of sequencing interesting, uh, mainly because it means that we're going to be sequenced multiple times by multiple people with multiple platforms and multiple agendas. Um, you know, the, you know, sort of the quote that I've heard lately is that people are going to pay you to sequence your genome at a certain point. You know, you'll get sequenced when you go to jail. You know, you'll get sequenced when your kid is born. Right? And this is what people are stressed about in the sort of privacy and civil liberties world. Um, it's not just that it's going to be cheap, it's going to be potentially democratized. So right now, if I get sequenced, unless I'm wealthy enough to commission it, the odds are I get sequenced at a clinical institution in a context where I don't get my data back. I get sequenced as part of a study. They maybe return uh, a PDF to me, or they send me an email. But they don't return the entire sequence because Myriad has a patent on some of the, the, the information they might give me, or because I might act in a way um, that they don't want me to act on the information. I might commit suicide if I discover I have a rare variant for Huntington's disease. But there's an increasing movement in the technology world and in the advocacy world to say if someone participates in a clinical study, they deserve a copy of all the data generated about them. So this came from Tim O'Reilly, who is a well-known technology thought leader and publisher in California. This is a letter that basically brought together the Silicon Valley technology elite saying, uh, if you participate in a lab test, there should be a federal rule requiring you get your data back. Now, there's no guarantee that what was measured was right. There's no guarantee that what was measured was coherent. But there's this emerging idea that you should get your access to, to the information back. Um, this is happening in health records, where we all know that what's in the health record is a record of when you went to the doctor and what they got reimbursed for, not whether or not it worked or whether or not you're healthy. But there's increasingly a standard format called Blue Button. And political movement to say that you should have access to your digital health record within 48 hours of requesting it in a computable format. And it's increasingly easy to commission as a citizen more complicated lab services. This is a startup that is exploiting the fact that core facilities got radically overbuilt over the last 10 years at places that are no longer getting lots of money for funding. So you have machines that are sitting silent at SUNY, machines that are sitting silent at the University of Tennessee, so I can go now and bid for the lowest vendor to do you know, NGS screening. I've got mass spec on here. We've got immunohistochemistry. And you have per sample rates. And it doesn't require that you be a scientist to access these services, that you be able to understand the outcomes of them. And it's not just democratized, but everywhere. So if you would like to have your iPhone be an ECG, you can buy a case that does that. 
There are companies now that are doing nothing but saying, how do we take the phones and turn them into health sensors so you can get blood pressure and heart rate from the camera in your eyeball? You can test neurodegeneration by using the accelerometer and the altimeter in the phones to check your gait or to record your voice. This is actually a guy who's here across the street at the Media Lab to check and see if your voice is quavering more or less over time to judge the progression of your Parkinson's. Right? You can even get it from photographs. So I have a friend who studied alcohol epidemiology on college campuses. He tried to go through an IRB and do standard processes. He realized that college students tend to drink out of cups with a very standard color profile. And so he could mine Facebook photographs looking for the RGB code of a red solo cup cross-reference them to the time at which they were posted and see if there were typos in the caption. <laughs> right. So there's data everywhere. Some of it's coming from sensors. Some of it's coming from places that didn't used to be data. Photographs didn't used to be data. Now they are. And we can use them to figure things out. <coughs> right. So this cheap data is becoming ubiquitous. right? But the cheapness of it is a necessary but non-sufficient condition to it actually being useful. So I think we're going to enter a period where people make some really bad decisions. I don't have any positive answers for that. I think that, that realistically, if you look at the way most people use the internet already with their health, they use it to get stressed out. You know, for all of the positive things that come out, right, the vast majority of people who use the internet self-diagnose complex diseases that they can't possibly have. Um, or they decide that they need to go off their chemo and take massive vitamin doses. Right? So, I don't know how we fix that. I don't have a good answer. I think one of the things we're concerned about at least is economic incentives. So, you know, not, I, I'm in favor of all the things you're describing, but like there will be economic incentives to drive certain behaviors. And you've seen this in healthcare, and that's yeah. the driver of many things. So, the extent that data is out there, it'll be interesting to see is there any counter to all the economic incentives to drive utilization of healthcare? Right. Well, so this is my, now this is my third hypothesis. This is the last one. Go ahead. So, there is the amount of data is growing, but large part of it are in these silos that are learning how to access. So for instance, you can write a Facebook app to get the data, but there is no API for section IT, and there is no API for many of these websites. What, what do you think about how to utilize it? So we have to create incentives for the various providers to be interoperable. I'm going to get to that in the back half of the talk. That's what I work on primarily, is trying to convince people to interoperate. Um, and that's a choice. We've, we've got to make that a choice that is a compelling competitive alternative to just being inside the Patients Like Me universe, or to just being inside the 23andMe universe, which right now I think is an increasing threat. All right, so, um, but my third hypothesis, and then I'm going to get into the actual stuff that I do, is that costs are not going to magically decline because of data. And I would argue that it's actually going to get worse. Costs are going to go up because of data during an interval time period if we don't handle it right. And so here's an example of a melanoma app. You take a picture of your skin tag or your mole, and you upload it, and algorithmically it tells you whether they go to the doctor or not and get a biopsy. Um, there are competitors. Right? Can you believe this? Anyone who, know, anyone who does dermatology gets really like starts to throw tomatoes at me, and I have to say I don't actually have an interest in any of these companies or like any of these apps. Uh, but it even goes all the way to this, which is you know. We'll upload it to a board-certified dermatologist for you. So they never tell you that the error bar in dermatology is, at best, two out of three accuracy by a, by a dermatologist viewing a picture. Right? So that's the human looking at it has a one in three error rate 
according to the dermatologist that I have talked to. Let's assume now false positive rates for the web services. Let's assume a million downloads, which does not put you into the top 25 apps on the App Store. So let's say you got a million downloads, and let's say it's a 10% false positive rate. It's $1,000 per biopsy. So we're looking at a $100 million false positive cost. Right? And based on the early analysis that's been done of these apps, they have a 95% false positive rate. Right? So it's not quite a billion dollars, <laughs> but it's really close. And this is one disease. And this is the cost of misapplying the data because we don't have the right framework. We don't have the right social framework. We don't have the right information sharing framework. And we have just assumed that because data, right, everything is going to get better. And so these three hypotheses, right, cheap data changes the epistemology, health data is becoming cheap, but data on its own is, is not sufficient to lower the cost, and in fact, may radically increase the costs. Right? So those are the three hypotheses that, that lead me to right, why I do what I do, which is I think the way that we deal with this is by creating some sharing systems, interoperability systems, that allow us to build a stable cohort and a baseline against which to start measuring the right things, measuring the right outcomes, and getting some accurate understandings of what the error bars are. Because in the absence of a standard baseline, it's very difficult to have a standard set of deviations and errors. But you can't measure something until you have a standard against which to measure it. And you can't educate people as long as there are economic incentives to fool them into paying $5 for your app and sending them to the doctor. Because right now, who gets hurt? App provider makes five bucks, doctor gets reimbursed for the biopsy, and the cost of the false positives are amortized across the rest of us through the insurance system. Well, this is a blank check for health care. And at no point do any of the app companies get a feedback loop that says how, what, what their false positive rate is, and none of them share it if they do. OK? So that's the setup. Now, the argument that I want to make, and on which I'm basing my career, is that small but coherent groups sharing can create asymmetrically valuable resources. And it's important, the argument here is small. And it doesn't take, if you have a large enough sample size, it doesn't take a large percentage of a population to create an incredibly valuable resource on the internet. Now, I could have used free software. I'm going to use photography. So this was the, one of the first high-resolution digital cameras. I didn't have one, but I wanted one when they came out. And this is what a new high-resolution DSLR looks like. They're running Android these days. And what's happened is that we have dramatically increased the sample size of photographers. So it used to be really expensive to have a good camera. Now people carry three or four cameras around with them everywhere they go. And it's not that there's a large percentage of photographers who share their work. It's definitely not true that there's a large percentage of professional photographers who share their work. But the increase in the sample size of photographers has meant that even if there's a tiny group down here in the bottom of the tail that likes to share things, right? it's not Gaussian. Right? It's a tiny percentage. It's maybe less than a hundredth of a percent of all photographers in the world like to give away their photographs. But there are so many damn photographers in the world now that take so many pictures that we have created massive amounts of online, high quality, high resolution photography in a way that is damaging the stock photography industry, that is changing the epistemology of that industry forever. Now, the coherence comes from standard legal tools like Creative Commons licenses that guarantee rights to share, common infrastructure, some of which is provided by companies, norms, right, which is I'm going to provide attribution and citation. Right? I am not going to take uh, photographs that are Getty images and pretend that they're open images. Right? And good metadata that lets me know if I'm looking for a picture of the status center that lets me find that. So it's not just having the group of people who like to share. It's not just having cheap photography. It's the coherentism that comes from the system around it. So solving the legal problem and solving the sample size problem are really important conditions. But what they do is they allow the rest of this stuff to explode. And when I talk about consent, think about it in that context. 
Consent isn't the problem. It's a precondition to solving the problem. But it's nowhere near the most difficult or the most interesting or the most valuable problem. It's just a, it's just, it's just a gate. And this is what it looks like. So if you go just to Flickr, right? And even Yahoo hasn't managed to kill Flickr, which is saying something, right? 400 million photographs under Creative Commons licenses at one corporate website alone. There's a company who sees value in providing access to free information. It's a tiny percentage of all the photographs on Flickr. Tiny. But it's large enough that you can build entire slide presentations out of resellable content. Because of that asymmetry, because of the small group built a coherent set of content. This has been proven again and again and again to work at least in software and content. It works in encyclopedias. It's beginning to work in textbooks. It's beginning to work in journal publishing. Right? We see this pattern again and again and again. So the experiment that we're trying to run is, right, let's see if a small but coherent group sharing data creates the same impacts in health. And the problem is right now, that there, there may or may not be a small group. We actually don't know how many people want to do this. But there is no coherence. So here's an example. This is me, right? Um, I'm a 23andMe customer, right? I carry the APOE4 allele, but only one copy. Uh, I carry uh, a couple of prostate cancer mutations. I carry a mild risk of Parkinson's, right? Um, I've shared this in a couple of places just to see how coherent it is if I do share it. So this is my uh, genotype inside the study I'm running at SAGE, which is a generic uh, donation. I'll, I'll show you how that works in a second. Um, this is just a copy of my 23andMe file. Right? It's not very valuable here. It's very hard to aggregate this. You don't have metadata. You don't have norms. As far as I know, no one has checked it out and run any analytics on it from the SAGE platform. So I decided I'm going to upload it to a different place. This is a wiki called OpenSNP. It's a, it's a picture of, I believe, Gregor Mendel is the default avatar. It's run by a graduate student in Germany who got frustrated that there wasn't a way to share genotype information. Um, if you put something on OpenSNP, it syndicates to another open wiki called Snippedia, where they actually run analytics on it. So I got an email uh, back from them saying, hey, if you'd like to look at your uh, health risks, here's what we've got. And so I've got, you know, uh, apparently I have a pretty bad hypertension risk. We didn't find that at 23andMe, which was interesting. And a strong probability that I won't go bald, which is cool, right? <laughs> Right. So I know this. This is sort of the point that I'm, that I'm, I'm building up to, right? I'm, I'm a relatively savvy user. Right. Well, and you have no idea. And, and so, so, so that, that's bad, right? So I could decide that I'm going to put my, I'm going to sort of, you know, I'm going to go to Mexico and buy hypertension drugs. Right? People, people do this. No, but it's, it's just, it's really, it's not, I mean, that's the world of medicine. This is the world of everything. Right. And the question, as you said, of how do we build, the, the, how do we build a good evidence base? Right, and how do we build the coherence around this? I mean, so what I'm, 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 I'm pointing out, this is incoherent information, right, even for me, and I am a, I'm an outlier in terms of my capacity to understand this. No, but the sad thing here is that the genetic variation works very simply. Let's take the simple case of common genetic variation. Right. And it should be, and this is my, you know, sort of, I'm very much in track with you, but it should be that we just have a very good knowledge base, and there is a huge amount of that data you want. You right. I mean? And we could start again with new groups of people and voluntary sharing, but the biases would be so strong right. that I think it would be worse shape than just the data that already exists that was incredibly carefully collected, just figure out how to make it available. Right. So in some cases, like, helpful and broadly, Right, and that's 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 the upside. Yeah. That's the upside. Um, so this also happened. Right? So someone else scrapes open SNP and SNPedia whenever you upload. He's a genealogist. He's a genetic genealogist in the UK, and so he sent me this, along with this sentence, 
which is probably the funniest <laughs> sentence I've ever gotten. I'm from Tennessee, so this was good news. I, but let's just, let's just stop and think about how badly this could have gone. I mean, all of it. Right, let's say that I didn't subscribe to the 23andMe service, and I just get my genotype. And I've never looked at the annotation. And it comes back and tells me I have you know, one of the rare carrier deficiencies or one of the really savage mutations in my genotype. And I didn't know. Right, let's say it tells me that my dad's not my dad. Right, or that my parents are inbred. Right? That's going to happen. Right? That is a statistical certainty that those things are going to happen as we grow the sample size. And so in the absence of the evidence base and the coherence, right, what we're going to get is people who think apps are enough and who push those out in a way that basically they, that everyone involved has an incentive to hide the uncertainty in the system, whether it's a physician or an app provider, an entrepreneur, an investor. And that's the problem. So what I do at SAGE, uh, you know, SAGE was part of the molecular profiling group at Merck, right? This was the group that took genotypes, intermediate clinical information, and outcomes, and put them into giant Bayesian and other kinds of <coughs> statistical models to try to associate strongly correlated variations with strongly correlated outcomes. Now, the people involved in that knew enough to not confuse it with causation. And it was a big chunk of what put 50-plus you know, products into the clinic, mainly diagnostic products. Right? The fact that so few of them got through is an indication of still how complex the universe is. But Merck was looking to sell the unit. And Stephen Friend and Eric Schott were able to negotiate all of the rights to all of the IP, the patents, the software, the data, out into a novel nonprofit biomedical foundation, which is Sage BioNetworks. And the goal is right, to build infrastructure that brings coherence to the people who do want to share data, as well as to attract the modeling community to come and start building models, right, going back to those features of, of communities going through epistemic change. We want to be able to bring groups of patients to come together and say, rather than you know, buying wristbands and walking for cancer, maybe we should take advantage, band together, and commission clinical grade data about ourselves and bring computational models to bear on it. And I'll, I'll give one example of how that works. But the idea is that as a patient, you should be able to either donate money or data. Because in many cases, being able to donate coherent data to be judged against the baseline of stuff that's out there is often more valuable than throwing dollars at somebody. Because no one takes an overhead cut off of your data. But if you can only raise $200,000 because only 5,000 people have your disease, 60% overhead is not acceptable, which is what happens when you sponsor research at a place like MIT. Now, if you want this, right, you do run up against the consent problem. And so this is what I work on, which is how do we basically get the consent process for those who are motivated to do this? How do we get the consent process to work for them? Because right now, consent segregates data into silos. It silos the data by study and by institution, and often by field of use. And very few people who sign up for consents know this. Right? There's an assumption that's been tested out sociologically that people have that when they consent to something, they assume their information is getting reused. They assume that more research will happen. They don't think that when they sign up for something, their data is going to be put away into a silo or a file cabinet and never be accessed again. I'm happy to, I, I, I could, it would take me two hours to not oversimplify the literature, but, yeah. I'm just saying, if you go to the Jackson Heart Study, yeah. Jackson, in Jackson, Mississippi, as I've done, and spent time with the community outreach board and had mm. participants in that study, they have very strongly the opposite point of view. And so the point I would raise mm. is different groups of people have very different views on this. That's a good point. We have to be systematically concerned about the exclusion of minority and disadvantaged populations, because in elite, the elite, I find, Mm. academic elite, the medical elite, there's the Silicon Valley elite, which is right. comfortable putting all this out there and creating billions of dollars. There are disadvantaged people in the society, there are people in the country who are right. very skeptical and who have the exact opposite assumption that you made, which is that if they've been promised their data won't be filled. Right. So, so it's, just, it's complex. 
Right, yes. So there, there's a sickle cell cohort at the uh, Oakland Hospital that I've talked to quite a bit. And again, the history of Tuskegee right. and other elements of that. It, but we wouldn't want to, but you know, we wouldn't want to inadvertently make decisions that would exclude minority populations from right. biomedical research and benefit because we assume that people in our life history right. are very comfortable and assume that it would be used broadly. My experience is that my experience is actually my experience is actually not that people uh, most people are not comfortable with what I'm about to show you. Right? Even the Silicon Valley elite are not comfortable with it. Most healthy people are not comfortable. The people who are comfortable with what I'm talking about tend to be people with rare diseases. Right? That's that's the group that is most comfortable with open consent, which is what I'm going to show you. Go ahead. So how many academic groups adopted the system of the possibility of consent? We're mainly using this at Sage right now. We've got, and then there, uh, open consent projects is one at Harvard Medical, the Personal Genome Project, and we're running five studies at Sage now, and we're sort of finalizing two with it with sort of big name medical centers, which will be the first real adopters. And UCSF uh, wrote PLC into their biobank grant that just got funded last fall. So this is all of this has been developed in the last 12 months. And so getting it adopted at academic medical centers takes 18 to 24 more after that. Because we had to get our first IRB approval. I would add an idea. It has to be a return. So not just a piece of paper that someone signed when they're going to lie to the doctor. It has to actually understand what they're signing. And I think that is a crucial point. That we need to the informed piece of the consent to teach the people. Right. And they need to make an informed decision if they want to take the risk for that. So I'll, I'll, let me show you the process. Uh, the, the feedback I get from patient advocates is that what I've built is far too informing because it scares people. And my point is that's exactly what we have to do. If we want to actually meet the ethical requirements right, of informed consent, we have to make clear that we don't understand the vast majority of the risks that you're running if you sign up to donate your data right now. And a lot of the things that people do to make people feel comfortable about participating in clinical research, de-identification, right, don't apply in a more open context, not as, not as, not as effectively or as powerfully. So let me run through this, and then you can, you can see it. So this is IRB approved. We got approved uh, last summer by Western IRB, which is a regional IRB, not an institutional one. And this is based on the Personal Genome Project at Harvard Medical School, but we extracted some of the core ideas and simplified them. Uh, so if you sign up, if you go to sign up for the study, what you get is first an overview, right? This is a complicated process. You can see from a UI perspective the process you're going to go through in a checklist along the right. Um, we start by saying that we're going to impose certain terms on researchers. And we're going to do this through terms of use. We're going to ask them not to re-identify. We're going to ask them not to harm. We're going to ask them to publish under the NIH open access policy. But we also make it really clear that all we can do is put this in a contract. And a contract is actually not very enforceable. So we're throwing some sand into the gears, but you should understand that we don't have power to go enforce and shut people down very easily if they're violating the terms of use. Just very hard. So you tell the patient that you will not try to re-identify them. But then you will write a paper using their data. And maybe part of the paper will be some raw data. Even not, not a lot, we're talking about huge files. Mm -hmm. But this paper will go out there, and then people can take that paper and re-identify them using that raw data. That's one of the risks we lay out. But sorry? That's one of the risks we lay out. OK, so it's not re-identify them, but just by the first, the first uh, patient. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the idea is that you should be comfortable with a lot of really weird risks if you're going to go forward with this sort of thing. right? And what I'm showing you is the bleeding edge. right? So think of this as the people who are the most elite and most comfortable or most desperate. Right, or most willing to share because they're just not getting any, any other systems that work for them. Right, if you're, like, let's take my sister. My sister uh, has a rare form of psoriatic arthritis. It's invasive. She's had, she was four years old. Um, she's had cancer as a result of embryo treatment. Right, we pay for her PET scans out of pocket now. Right, there's zero economic risk. Right, and she is getting no help. The current answer is, we don't really know what's wrong with you. We think it's arthritis. It may be lupus. You may have a form of leukemia. We don't really know what's going on. All we know is that we can give you, uh, if you take Embril, it lets in soft palate cancers. So we can't give you Embril. We're afraid to give you other COX inhibitors as a result. right? 
So for her, the economic risk is quite low, the social risk is quite low, the, de the debate is should we cut your arm off at the elbow because the locus of the arthritis is your wrist. Right? And there are lots of people for whom that is their medical reality. So what I'm showing you is not for people who are being served well by the system. And I don't expect that this is going to be the norm. Right? I expect that you're going to see far more complex, granular, and controlled systems emerge for sharing in a more frictionless manner, but that contain more protections. But part of what we're trying to do is to spur the emergence of those systems. Right? Sometimes you have to actually throw things into the mix that are open enough to scare the hell out of people to create systems that are a little more closed, but better than what we have now. But, but there's two things you're saying that, that I'm just a little puzzled by. Yeah. I mean, or seem at least, I'm puzzled by, they seem like they're not entirely aligned. So there's one mission, which is what you just described, is very compelling. Mm -hmm. But there's another, which is to have a, a database against which the people who might have all this genomic or other testing mm -hmm. can compare themselves. Yes. And we already have this huge ascertainment bias, which is that when you go look at the human disease database, database all these things, only the people in depth of grade and distribution phenotypes are going to do. And so you're going to be freaked out because it's going to say, here's your chance of having breast cancer with BRCA. But since no one ever went and did people who had no risk and didn't have it, we vastly overestimated those risks. So having a valid data set requires not only including people at the extreme. So it's just it's a conundrum. Yeah, I don't, and, and that's a recruitment problem. Well, but except that a lot of people not at the extreme have already been studied. So okay. I just have an aspiration that what you're doing here will be Right. And my, and my goal in this is, you know, we're, so we're running these studies, right, in rare diseases, Fanconi anemia, right. The, the, the goal is to get to the point where you start to have interoperability, where you can pull people from either a normal data set or a non-normal data set. Or, or in many cases, someone who's got a single point genetic mutation may have the rest of their genome be useful from a control perspective in other ways. Right. If you can reuse the data effectively, right, that's, that's what mathematicians and bioinformaticians are for. So anyway, this, this is what you get, right? You see these sorts of things. You, if you mouse over a word, you get the IRB-approved definition of things like re-identification. Right? We try to teach people that uh, you know, if someone says that you've been de-identified and you've uploaded 5,000 data points about yourself, you can probably be re-identified. Right? The debate, as far as I can tell, is between is it, is it four data points or 100 data points. And your medical record alone, even if we take out your identifying information, will be a unique fingerprint to you, especially if you're sharing it. Um, you have to check boxes that say, right, I, I am giving the right to do research. Right? I'm giving the right to redistribute within the same system so that if I've done a model based on your data and I now want to share it with Todd, right, Todd's got to be able to incorporate the data into his new model if he wants to run a, an incremental improvement on the model. Um, the right to publish results. We want to make sure people understand that they're giving the right to publish. And the right to commercialize products. And so the goal in this is not to create something that says you can't use this to discover a drug, you can't use this to make software that you sell. Right? This is a donation, not a conditional license grant of data. Right? It may emerge that investment in a conditional way of your data makes sense. Right? I actually think that's probably going to be a business sector of people who bank their data and then the bank invests it on their behalf <coughs> in ways that they have set up their own risk profiles. Right? But you can't, I don't think you can start there. And then you have to watch a video. Right? The video is about eight minutes long, and it goes through lots of risks and harms, primarily the idea that we don't understand them. Now, uh, you know, I show this to privacy uh, designers in, in Silicon Valley whose job it is to make you ignore the fact that you're giving away your data, and it's like I threw up on the conference table. <laughs> Right? So you, you go to Apple and Facebook, right? their job is to make you not realize that you're giving away data and that there's potential harm. And so this runs counter to the entire sort of mobile and social data culture that we're developing. Um, and what's depressing is then I show it to patients who have rare diseases who just want in and they say, this is depressing. All you're showing me is risks because I'm not comfortable giving them guaranteed benefits in this process yet, because we actually don't know what the benefits are going to be, and most of the benefits are going to be societal, not individual. Right, so why don't you want to show them? Why don't you show them, you know, there are this many papers based on, I don't know, PCGA data that was used in informed consent, and 
So we have we have that in the we have that in sort of the surrounding materials, but not in the consent process itself. We we probably went a little too heavy on um, our goal was to make sure that no one, to the extent that we could do it, no one would come back and say you seduced us improperly, right? Um, so we put stuff into the surrounding information, the FAC, all of which is also IRB approved. Uh, but we, we we maybe went a little overboard. We're in the process of doing a new video and a new and a new wizard. Uh, to see if we can strike a, a more positive balance. But we, in, in the beginning, especially, we, this has been running for about six months, um, we didn't want anyone to get through by accident thinking that we lied to them or that we promised them a rose garden uh, and didn't tell them about the thorns. Right? So once you've gotten through all of this, we allow you to bail. Right? Uh, so there's actually a, a bailout screen that says, I don't like this, take me out of here. If you, if you still want to go forward, you have to check three more boxes. Right? I understand the uncertainty and the risk. I provide consent. Even though I can withdraw at any time, we'll delete your data from our servers. If the data has been distributed, we can't guarantee we can go get it from those who, to whom it has been distributed. And then and only then are you presented with a consent form to sign. Do you, do you only have one level of sharing, which is entirely public? So the, it, it is, it is de-identified, right but public, yes. So I was threatened with a patent lawsuit by a company that provides granular privacy controls if I created anything that was more granular. Leaving that aside for a second. So that was, that was the first thing. So we, we started there. We started there. Uh, what I realized, though, is actually uh, it's not a bad thing right, to create the unitary option first. Right, so the question is, how, how granular do you let people get? Do you let them control it to academic or corporate? Do you let them add a field of use restriction? I thought autonomy of the, of the participants was actually defined It's a part of it, but you need to have a larger organization to host, manage, and create guarantees for that. No, but if we had that. Oh, yeah. Get at the vision we would like, oh, yeah. We yeah. That's, that that's where this ends up, right? I mean, I, I think this ends up with something that looks an awful like a credit union. Right, so uh, you know, let's let's take again me as an example, right? So I carry APOE four. I have a prostate cancer genetic risk. Um, I have a sister with psoriatic arthritis. I have another sister who's autistic, right? So I might say I'm going to deposit my data at the credit union under a consent that says you can distribute this to anyone for any reason if it's autism or psoriatic arthritis, prostate cancer, or yeah, Alzheimer's, exactly the right? But if it's erectile dysfunction, right? I want you to check in with me, and I might want to get paid part of the recruitment fee. Right? That's, you can do that through a, an organization in a way that you can't do that through a standard. So also the risk that you showed are quite vast and then refer to basically genomic data, but if I just want to share some data, just a photo of myself right. or something like that, something. So, so some of the risks don't apply. So. Well, let me, let me, so that we actually, we'll, we'll, we can take anything, right? So uh, we take in health records, abstract text, genotype files, Right, we, have a, we bias people towards the primary genotyping platforms and blue button health records because they're more parsable. We can de-identify them algorithmically. Uh, whereas when people upload scanned PDFs of their health records, I mean, you can blur the top seven millimeters and the bottom seven millimeters of every page, which is where your name almost always is on your scanned health record. But, but, but the way but, that you present the risk, are not, you don't try to stratify based on the data. So no. I mean, if you just upload them. No. no, I mean, this is a blunt instrument for now. Right? The, the, part of what happens with technology standards is that you, you, you solve a simple problem, then you evolve more complex solutions around that. And that's, that's the sort of ethos here. I was at the Web Consortium working on standards, and you know, what I learned there was if you can solve a single simple problem but allow evolution around it, then you can get a lot better. So I, I view this as you know, HTTP or TCP IP, and what we need is HTTP secure. Right? We need applications that use HTTP secure that provide more complicated services to people. No, no, there is API around that, so basically if you want to, I want now to, to implement that in my website. Right. So basically I go to your website and, and, and I get some certification basically. 
The way, that the, the way that this works right now is that you would go get a login and a password at Sage's compute environment and check the data in and out from there. After you sign the terms of use indicating that you're not going to hurt people, you're not going to attempt to re-identify, and you'll publish open access. That's how it works right now. The goal is to get to a point where we have an interoperating network of open consent. Right? So I don't want everyone, it would be awesome if everyone started using my consent. My instinct is that everyone's IRB is going to want to make changes to the form and that everyone's IRB is going to want to make changes to the wizard and the process. So what we're, what we're moving towards is taking OpenSNP, SNPedia, Personal Genome Project, Sage, patients like me, and moving towards commitment to an interoperable standard of open consent and then certifying implementations as conforming to that standard, which would allow different IRB implementations of consent and wizards, but it would allow data portability between the conforming implementations. That's how the web works. And that's what we're aiming towards. What about time? What if I only want to be using my data for the next three years? That's not something that we can pull off. Right? Again, so, so this, the way that, the, the way that like, HTML works is there's a document that describes how HTML works. And there's people who make servers that conform to that implementation. That's the methodology here, as opposed to an organization that can provide those sorts of services and guarantees. So that's the sort of thing that I would imagine, if we're successful getting patients like me on board with this, which we're close, that they would provide that as a We would say, if you, listen, if you want to do that, if you want to share in a time-limited way, go to a control-based company that provides that service, right? Because it's, it's just easier to do that. And I'm, I'm gonna, I need to run through a couple more here, right? This is the, just as, a, as an archive, if you want to look at the consent document or the wizard, they're available. They're available for redistribution. They're not available for derivative works right now because the IRB doesn't want people changing them because they've been approved. And as I said, we're moving towards this standards approach, which is we don't want to force Personal Genome Project to use PLC, but we want cross flow of data between SAGE and PGP. We want to be able to pull their data in. We want them to be able to pull our data in. So if you want to matriculate up through sequencing stuff, right? PGP is really into that. If you want to do microbial um, if you want to do gut sequencing, right, that's who you do that with. If you want to do clinical stuff, you go up through SAGE. Um, we do have a recontact protocol through the de-identified system. So if a researcher finds someone with a phenotype or a genotype that's interesting, they can send them an email without knowing who they are to recruit them into a more traditional clinical context. Um, right now, it looks like this. You have to go in through SAGE's Synapse uh, database to access the information. But the goal is to get out to a federated environment where you don't really necessarily know or care from where the patient's consent came, as long as they came through a certified consent process. And you don't really know where the data lives, right, or originally lived, because it's been aggregated into the right compute environment so you can run the right analytics on it of the right interest. You know, I, I sort of imagine that you're going to get a scale-free network with some hubs that say, you know, here's a bolus of open consented data that lives next to the right compute environment for doing high, you know, hardcore genetic analysis. Right? Here's a bolus of data that's optimized for doing health record-based analysis. Right? Here's, a, here's a bolus that's optimized for doing payment analysis. Because people are going to curate the same information different ways for different kinds of analytics. But it doesn't make sense to think that everyone's, everything's just going to live magically in the cloud and get aggregated in at query runtime. Right? That's, I think, an irrational belief. And let's apply this back into the skin cancer problem. So let's imagine if we could get the people who were in the 95% false positive rates to send us the pictures that they took and gave to the app and to go get their digital pathologies from their doctors, which they have the legal right to do. And we could run a contest to build a better classifier. So this is one we just ran at Sage on, uh, it started with the Metabrick data on breast cancer, and we've actually, we're, we're now running the validation phase. Um, we had, you know, something like 350 plus models from more than 35 countries, from 50 different unique teams and individuals, building better algorithmic classifiers using exactly this kind of digital pathology data. And the idea being that we could basically run these contests, if we could get people to donate their pictures and their pathology under PLC, not a lot of risk there. You don't have a lot of identifiable information in the skin tag picture or the digital pathology file if we clean them right. Fairly low risk. We can run a much more positive video for those people as part of the consent process because they're not giving us their entire EHR or their genotype. We can run this sort of contest and we can donate the classifier and all of the classifiers back to all the app companies and say, please, by God, lower your false positive rate. 
We're running five of these studies this year under PLC. We're running a melanoma one specifically. Right? We've run the breast cancer one. We're running a Fanconi anemia one. We're running a diabetes, and we're running a Parkinson's study. Now, and I'm going I'm to wrap up. Um, the point I want to leave you with is that it's likely that we're going to end up with a monopoly of some sort in this information space right, of sort of health and biology. And that's because monopolies lower transaction costs in complicated high transaction cost environments. Right? But once they get entrenched, they're really hard to move. So this is as of September. I had no idea how dominant Windows XP still was in computing. Right? So although you have you know, OS X and, and, and mobile systems, right, the vast majority of computers that visit Wikipedia, and this is, the, this, is, this is OSs that visit Wikipedia as of September, remain Windows. And so if we entrench the wrong monopoly, it will be very hard to unentrench it for a long time in health. And if you look at what Epic does in healthcare files, you have a sense of what I'm talking about. Right? Fax machines remain the dominant monopoly in health. And that's the opportunity. So as we make the transition to cheap data, there's an opportunity to get the right monopoly in. Right? And monopolies have a tendency to do incremental innovation as well. This is why it's so important to get it right, right now. And when I worked across the street, Jerry Sussman, who's a professor at, at CSAIL, who's a very funny guy, used to give this example for incremental innovation. And it was, you know, your ear is a good information gathering technology, so the obvious incremental improvement is to make your ear bigger. Right? And if you have the metaphors wrong, Right? This is the electronic health record that we have, and this is the system that we're moving towards, right? which is you know, basically taking the wrong metaphor, digitizing it, and making all of our incremental innovation and all of our massive government funding go towards it. So the choices that I would argue we have and the three monopoly choices we get to make, right? one is you know, just like now but more so, right? and that's what I think was happening at NCATS and, and, and some other places, and it's very well intentioned. Right? These are systems that are working, and we're going to put more money into them. We're going to do more translational research the way that we've always done it, right? without changing the epistemology of the field because of cheap data. Right? The cartel right, is choice number two. Right? And so Facebook helps you connect and share with the people in your life. Right? This is 23andMe's stated business model. They want to help you connect and share with the clinical research system. And they'll let you take your genotype, but nothing else. Right? None of the surveys you take, none of the annotations belong to you. They belong to them. And they'll be able to negotiate with a small group of companies. Right? And patients like me have certainly operated in this fashion. They've been more willing to engage with me than other companies in this space. Right? But the cartel is a fairly reasonable option. Right? It gets us there faster with more guarantees. And you can do this with my data for three years. You can only give it to people for autism and so forth. And the third choice is the commons. Right? I'm going to argue that they, they only emerge if you make the commons choice. That's my point. Right? So the network, right, the digital network, allows all of these choices to exist simultaneously. Right? And so that's why I think it's the only other choice. Right? Because the network allows all of these choices to exist at the same time. It allows NCATS. It allows the cartel. But it preserves the capacity to add unanticipated functions to the system without asking permission either of the NIH or of the cartel of companies that pull this off. So the reason that I do what I do is that I think it's, it's the only way to preserve the freedom to add unanticipated features to a complicated system, which we are guaranteed to get wrong the first time we build it. And consent is a tiny little piece of the solution. It's a critical piece, but it's a tiny little piece. And my hope is that I've convinced you of the need for coherence around that legal consent and around that small group of people who might be willing to take a set of risks. Thanks. <laughs>